morning. This is the uh, plate of recap and reflections from last night's uh, um, Joff campaigns, Chronicles of Joff. Um, we are in Blackfish Bay. This is like session 14 or 15 in Blackfish Bay. Session 34 um, for the entire uh, Chronicles so far. Um, myself is Eric, the 17 year old um, farmer's son um, who's taken up arms to to um, eradicate or to uh, to um, remove a grudge guardian curse from my family's property. Uh, joining uh, Lauren, a uh, fighter, human fighter, that's David's character. Um, uh, Trotter Fingersmith, the halfling, uh, uh, you know, thief, I think is his class, is uh, uh, Dale's character. Uh, he's <clears throat> he in in a way is responsible for the curse um, that cost me my uh, uh, family, etc. And then of course uh, uh, back again, John as uh, Bomrick got it right, Bomrick the uh, dwarf, and uh, uh, he turned out to be again uh, well well needed, uh, much help, and of course it's always great to have. John at the table. It's always great to have a full party of of characters doing their thing, and uh, he, he being a dwarf knows a little bit about this lore that we're dealing with, right? This, this thing. So, um, last we left off, we were um, uh, excavating. So, the only way we can um, <clears throat> end this uh, grudge guardian or to be safe from it um, is uh, daytime sunlight uh, renders it um, uh, sunlight renders it uh, dematerializes it or renders it um, ineffectual so to speak but at night this thing is uh, can, you know, will follow us, hunt us and try to of course kill us as it sees us as desecrators of uh, of their tombs, um, uh, okay. Which of course uh, we we are, but we aren't. <laughs> you know, we, of course we are, but you know, uh, to us, uh, it's you know, it's um, okay. So uh, uh, sorry, I haven't had my I haven't had my coffee yet this morning. So hold one. All right. All right. So I got to get my coffee flow in here. Okay. So we're in our third uh, day, and, I think maybe a day and a half of uh, paying uh, a crew, a ship crew to join uh, six civilians, which as deputies who had been um, vandalizing and had, uh, had uh, kicked the local priest from the village and had tried to, uh, had been protesting and trying to destroy the church in town. We as deputies uh, had arrested them and uh, 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 demanded they show up and dig at uh, to excavate this tomb. So our plan, if we excavate the tomb, we can put light upon the entire tomb uh, during the day and rendering it uh, ineffective, ineffective. But we need to, there's a certain thing we have to do to destroy the curse, to, to to end this beast, according to Dwarven lore, and Bomrick seem, seems to understand and know that ritual, what we had to do. So this is how we came up with the idea that we needed to excavate and shed light on the area, and uh, uh, particularly on his bones uh, to uh, end this curse. Okay. So, uh, Arig marched off uh, a certain a certain distance from the mouth of this tomb that he could recall from his adventures inside the tomb where he thought we should begin the excavate. Uh, and this was at an area of, of, of a crossroads uh, area uh, where Jocko, my former character, had been killed by this creature. And then from there, uh, we didn't know, we hadn't gone further, so we really didn't know where the bones would be buried, but uh, Eric had walked off that 
paste off that a distance and set them at the corners and said, start digging down and in toward this part. And we'll, we'll just go from there. So um, they broke ground, um, shedding light inside the chamber at the end of session 33. So session 34, we start um, deciding, you know, how, what do we want to do now? Do we want to keep digging? Do we want to investigate? And Avery stuck his head in, threw a torch down and could see Jocko's body and knew we were in the right place and, uh, you know, let them continue to dig. We, um, we uh, uh, have Bomberick walk up on us uh, and we greet Bomberick. We show him, um, you know, he, he sticks his head in and checks around inside the chamber. Uh, after much uh, uh, debate, we decide we should, he, he wants to go into the tombs and further investigate and, and maybe, try to assess some things. And uh, so we decided we'll lower him in right there, save some time instead of him going through the front door of the tomb and navigating back to this area. We'll just lower him down on a rope. So I and uh, Lauren and et cetera, lower Bomber down uh, into the tomb. And he begins to look at the murals and investigate uh, the murals on the wall, trying to make sense of it. And out of the darkness uh, comes the, uh, the, 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 the grudge guardian and attempts, uh, and we very quickly, we win initiative and uh, we we just pull Bomberick up as a unit. All of us heave him up off his feet and out of the range of this swinging, angry, uh, cursed dwarf. It's basically a court, it's a, it's a manifestation of a grudge guardian is a dwarf. So Bomberick hangs there, feet dangling as this thing tries to striking and it can't come within the sunlight so it's kind of outside this the range of sunlight there um lauren um asked if anybody has a mirror and uh, a rig says yes my mother does a hand mirror that was a gift from my father when he traveled to the big city he brought it back to her and it's it's in the house uh, again this is my property this is uh a rig's family's property and uh, uh we agree um we should get that so uh, Aaron, um, uh asks or thinks to send uh, Lauren. Um, and I think this might be when Bomrick, no, Bomrick was already there. Uh, so anyway, Aaron turns to run back to the farmhouse to retrieve this mirror, this hand mirror. But along the way, he sees out of the corner of his eye that his family uh, has been dug up. The bodies have been uh, uh, exhumed and tossed about. Uh, and that, that arrests me immediately as a rig. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I stop what I'm doing and I head over to my, 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 my parents, my siblings, and, uh, you know, a rig is, uh, this is, you know, again, further horror and trauma upon a rig as he's already had to deal with his family murdered by this beast. Um, now to have their bodies exhumed and tossed about, uh, we, we, no, Arig believes uh, uh, also the bodies of the two adventurers that desecrated the tombs have had this happen multiple times. So Arig is pretty certain it's the Grudge Guardian that does this, uh, exhumes them, and, and you know. So Arig is emotionally it's it's a hammer blow, and so he falls to his knees, and he uh, you know loses it, um, and gets up, draws weapons, and and runs back up the hill directly toward the hole screaming desecrator and is determined now to to drop into that hole and to kill the scourge guardian um a uh attributes are nine i rolled them up live in session after jocko died i did it in roll 20 uh actually you, you can see me rolling that character up in roll 20 while they're playing and i literally rolled five nines and one six right down the line nine 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 six wisdom nine charisma i mean he's literally average and he's a 17 year old farmer's kid so it, it ironically it works out okay but his wisdom is a six so again i use attributes also to cue how i want to play a, a character so with a wisdom of six you know he's you know he might be very emotional he might be very um Im immature in a way right so anyway he sees red crying and sobbing races up the hill uh to go kill the grudge guardian right again he's not going to be able to do it but I don't play the game, uh, you know, I don't meta the game that way. I play from a character's perspective. So Lauren sees him coming and sees, oh, Avery's, he's 
you know, he's lost it. And, and Laura attempts to stop me, but I, I, I beat him on a uh, dex check and I grab the rope while the, the whole party's holding the rope because Bomberick, the 300 pound dwarf, still hanging <laughs> up the grudge guardian. And Arid grabs the rope, slides down onto Bomberick and kind of uses Bomberick as a, a, a something to slow him down so I don't drop 15 feet full speed. So, you know, break your legs, right? So, you know, Arig's not so dumb to just dive headlong into this hole. He's going to use the rope and he's going to slide down and use Bomberick's shoulders and body, et cetera, to slow himself as he drops into the floor. And uh, we have a melee there, but um, the creature, because I'm standing in the sunlight, the creature can't hit me. So his, his axe will dematerialize, right, as he would hit the sunlight. But twice, uh, had I not been in the sunlight, it would have... Uh, it would have ultimately badly wounded me twice, at the minimum, if not killed Arig again. So this is my third time Arig is, fourth time Arig has been face to face with this creature. He can't harm it, really. And the creatures somehow managed um, dice. You know, this is what I love about, this is where the game, this is where role playing gets gamey, is in dice, is in random variables like dice. Because I don't, and I've had this discussion before, I've I've been very honest about this. I don't think role playing is a game. Role, game, role playing has game elements. That's what makes it, you know, and it's social, et cetera, but it's not a game by the by the strict term of game, right? <clears throat> and game of chance is not the same as a game, right? But the point is, uh, this really, for me, uh, very, uh, you know, Arig, I'm angry. I want it, I want it dead. I, I, have, I am tired of this trauma and this, this psychological, you know, torture that we've been under you know uh but especially des you know digging up my mother and father again and you know so a rig you know in a fit has this melee with a grudge uh, guardian it can't hurt me fortunately but i miss it multiple times and on the third or fourth bomb rig throws oil into the room uh bursting like a like a hand grenade uh, lit he lit oil on fire throws a molotov cocktail for the lack of a better term behind it and uh, it uh, it doesn't appear to have affected this uh, this uh, grudge guardian. Um, Avery takes advantage of that explosion of light, etc. Throws this stuff down and grabs the grudge guardian, pulls him into the light. And fortunately, I succeed at grabbing his beard and his 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 body, and, and I pull him into the light, and he dematerializes instantly. And again, Avery, uh, fate you know, frustrated and uh, heartbroken that he can't stop this thing. He can't hurt this thing. But at the same time, somewhat relieved that he's still alive, falls to his knees, sobbing in the dark, in the, in the sunlight of this tomb. And Bomberick lowers himself down, pats, uh, you know, pats Abrook on the back, says, you did good, kid. You did good, kid. Me and I describe how there's snot and, you know, he's just sobbing. And, uh, you know, uh, I tap his hand with a snotty hand and, uh, you know, uh, he gets up and he, uh, composes himself enough to grab up his shield and sword and, uh, you know, covered in, you know, uh, having had red eyes swollen, etc. as he is, you know, at his wits end with this situation he finds himself in. So we uh, get the mirror, uh, we send Trotter to the house since Arig was, was, uh, was uh, curveballed, so to speak, uh, as Arig uh, never got to the house to get the mirror. Trotter goes into the house to get the mirror. Trotter returns in the mirror, gives it to Lauren, and Lauren uh, gets to Bomber. Bomber starts reflecting the sun around the room on these jewels on this map. So this map is a mural. It's a. It's basically it would be a. Uh, it would be a panoramic view of the the Sunder Mountains uh, with all of the tor dwarven towers of lore. Uh, and on this mural in this tomb uh, are the jewels all over the walls that 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 highlight stars. I'm assuming or other things, but the mural wraps 360 degrees around all four corners of this of this uh, tomb. And so Bomberk is is reflecting sunlight onto these areas, and he does. He manages to hit one that lights a beam that lights a spot at the base of the Sunder Mountains. And uh, we get a pick down. Uh, Arig takes control of the mirror, keeps that spot lit, and uh, Bomber, for the lack of a better term, or you know, decides, well, this could be a, just a map telling us where to look. But just in case it means here in the tomb, he 
takes a pickaxe to that spot. Doesn't really get anywhere, uh, but the but the ceiling now has been slowly caving in. By the way, so on every turn, Todd rolls to see if this this ceiling that we've excavated hole into the tombs collapses. So we know we're living on borrowed time. But but there's a when he hits that pickaxe and and more falls, we decide we better get out of there before the the ceiling collapses in on us. So we get up and out. Um, and we begin a conversation. What do we do now? I mean, we only have so much light. We only have, we have 14 diggers. We can't continue to excavate this because we're, we don't know where the body of this grudge guardian lay. Um, the ceiling's going to collapse. We stay up here trying to dig it, dig, dig it up from the, from, you know, we're trying to dig up something we're standing on. That's clearly going to give way and cave in, which would not be good. We'd be caving in all of this earth and filling up the tomb, which is not something we want to do. So they stand around and discuss this at the top of the tomb. Well, they, they all kind of evacuate the area and get to the edges and they have a conversation about what do we go? Maybe we should walk off the distance, et cetera, et cetera. And, it's, and Arig leaves to to um, to get his family's bodies um, uh, straightened up. And he starts to build a, a pyre. Uh, he decides, I'm not going to bury them so they can be uh, forever uh, desecrated, for they, so they can forever be exhumed and, you know, not allowed to rest. And so Avery decides he's going to give them a, a funeral pyre. He's going to build a funeral pyre, and he's going to give them a cremation burial. Um, uh, because I'd rather that than do, have to bury them every day. And if we never can stop this grudge guardian, then they're doomed to be, to, to rot in the sunlight uh, you know, basically. So Avery decides he's going to build a funeral pyre. And I'm doing that while they're having this powwow and they're discussing what do we do and how are we going to do it? And they're talking about all this stuff. And they don't even realize Avery's wandered off and is doing this. And at some point, Todd asks, what's Avery? What do you think? Or somebody says, or oh, Lauren says, Avery, what do you think? And that's when they realize I'm down the hill working uh, away. And they leave me be as I prepare their funeral pyre, which is very cool. They decide that they're going to shift down west past the doors uh and uh, these doors of a room we have not been in and um, they're going to for the lack of it they're going to make up guess a, a best guess that this could be the dwarven burial chamber since it's the architecture of the tombs is very much like where we found the elf burial chamber this is just north of that uh, and so logically they assess that this is probably where the dwarf is buried right so they they move west, you know, about 40 feet or so, whatever, and they start to excavate over those doors, um, uh, basically, to shed light into that chamber. And Arig, of course, uh, gets the pyre lit and uh, stays with them while they, uh, they, well, while they burn and get fully uh, burning, says a few uh, mumbled prayers, and then uh, I return to the top to help dig, etc. Trotter, meanwhile, has left because he has an idea, and he takes some of his crew uh, and Stallworth, his captain of his uh, boat, they get on the boat and they cross the Lake of Talons uh, all the way over to the east bank, where that we that where Trotter had encountered the tents of the uh, of the um, uh, diving bell uh, uh, creature that we had encountered on our adventures through that area uh, many sessions ago, uh, because. Trotter wants to find out what that hose was, uh, what uh, what Arig had thought was a serpent this, that, that went from the tents down into the lake. Um, Arig thought was some kind of serpent, but Trotter had got, uh, gotten a closer view of it from where he went because he wandered down to the tents, got a closer view of it. It, it, was, it looked as if it was eel skin stitched together. So he wanted to go see if he couldn't find out more about that and get that. So he has an idea of to, to do something with that eel skin. When he gets there, he finds the camp's gone. Uh, somebody has hurriedly packed it up and left remnants of their camp. Um, and they, there's about 20 feet of this ill skin um, hose available for Trotter to gather up. And uh, he, t he he pulls that up as an example, and he might be able to find someone in town to maybe make another one. And so he, he comes back. He gets back about the time uh, that we are uh, now into the... Um, uh, dwarven uh, tombs. Well, we decide, actually, I take that back. We decide um, we do not want to uh, uh, be here too long uh, with sunset because that the dwarven 
bread's guardian when sunsets manifests itself wholly and we probably couldn't stop it but one thing's for certain even if we beat it uh it'll just dematerialize we'll never kill it this way so we go we all get back on the boat we go back out in the safety of the, of the lake and we this time we go north up the lake uh and and rest uh away from the bridge guardian who uh will follow us to the water uh and bellow all night long and we can't sleep while he's doing this so the next morning we return we disembark we go back and we complete that uh excavation shedding light on 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 the area and we peek our heads in and sure enough we can see a uh dais with a with a tomb or a casket on the top of it it is dwarven in uh, make it is dwarven in length it has dwarven writing on it so we know we found the place of a buried dwarf and we are pretty certain this is our grudge guardian and cursed for eternity to do, to to go after anybody who desecrates the tomb so Bomber and I decide, Bomberick and I, excuse me, Bomberick and I decide to drop in here uh, with a torch, shield in hand, and attempt to get this casket open or get it exposed to sunlight. Because, again, the lore, uh, according to the Dwarven uh, rich uh, lore and according to Bomberick's recollections of this from uh, the first time we ran into this creature, of what must occur to, to end it, is exposing the bones to the sunlight, okay? Easy, right? Well, in, in the darkness, the Grudge Guardian comes for us. Uh, it fails again to hit us because we're standing in the sunlight. So we're navigating this tight space, uh, somewhat in the dark, but somewhat in the light. And we're trying to get the casket into the light or trying to get the bones into the light, etc. Meanwhile, while Bomrick is investigating and reading what the runes on the side of the, the uh, casket say, uh, as uh, a Lauren flashed the uh with the mirror flashed the light upon uh the grudge guardian and made it dematerialize so we're kind of catching our breath as this thing again came out of the darkness kept trying to fight us uh he's reading this and as he reads this a uh a, a, a shadowy uh tendrilled long arm reaches out of the darkness at bomrick which i'm able to uh uh shun away with my torch because i have a torch and a shield lit just in case and uh, it 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 retreats back into the darkness and we've seen this thing before uh uh as uh jocko had turned this shade as it tried to reach out of the darkness and grab characters uh as we've journeyed to this tomb before um however and uh, avery was the torch bearer in that group so um avery we would have seen it everybody even bomrick would have seen this uh, creature so we anyway he waves the torch at it, and fortunately, it retreats. And um, we decide, let's pop the top of this casket and and get these get this moved or get these bones moved to the sunlight. So as uh, we pop the casket, he describes what we see. You know, there he is. There's the uh, entombed dwarf with his helmet on his lap, or uh, you know, in his uh, arms. He's wearing a golden mask uh, uh, over his face. He is armored. He's got. He's buried with stuff you know and uh from the darkness again materializes the grudge guardian and comes after us again and um, uh we win initiative and so uh i grab the helmet and throw it at it because again a rig really wants to hates this thing and wants it gone so i throw the helmet at it and then i grab the golden mask and i throw the golden mask at it while bomberick is retreating into the light. Uh, so here I'm kind of staying in the darkness with a torch and I'm, with one and on the other hand, I'm throwing the Gretsch Guardian's, it's his own body, his own parts at it. And Bomrick says, no, the bones, grab the grab the body, throw, the, throw it into the sunlight. So Bomrick reaches in and successfully scoops up this dwarven uh, skeleton, the body, and he pitches it into the sunlight. And with a terrifying woeful scream the grudge guardian uh dissipates uh arig i describe arig so elated with this uh that he throws down his shield and his torch and, and hugs bomberick and tries to pick him up you know like he wants to hug him and pick him up celebrating but he can't you know bomberick's 300 pounds he can't get him off the ground but he squeezes bomberick in celebratory because for arig finally this is over we've killed this thing we're safe I can't believe it. It's done. It's over. So we celebrate. We go through the we go through the uh, 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 tomb, 
we find all of his treasures, uh, the chain mail and, and axe and helm and everything go to uh, Balmerick. We find four treasure vessels, clay vessels full of gold uh, and a couple other things, a silver vial of some kind of silver liquid, which uh, Avery puts in his backpack. Don't we, we don't know what it is. And Avery kind of just, uh, wow, and throws it in his backpack, not really thinking much about it. Uh, matter of fact, I'd forgotten about it at the, by the end of the session, but it's in the set. It's in his uh, backpack. And we come up out and we are celebrating ultimately, but we're not certain that he's dead. So we're going to be careful. We'll probably have to get on the boat again tonight and see. But Arig, uh fully believes this is over. Arig is 100% believes we have we have done it. And Arig, um makes an offer to Trotter that he would sell the house and the land to Trotter for 100 gold pieces for his share of the clay pots. I want your clay pot with 100 gold. Uh, I've already got my clay pot, but I want that. And Arig explains, because I can't stay here. I mean, I've, I've suffered too much here. I thought I could, but after my parents and, you know, and after seeing their bodies desecrated and, and, and all of this, there's no way I could live here. Right. So, um, I'm willing to sell the deed to the farm and the house to, to Trotter for a hundred gold. And, uh, Trotter immediately accepts the deal, says you got it. And, uh, uh, Avery just announces that he, he, I will not be living here. I will not be trying to, I will not be trying to make a life here anymore. Uh, meanwhile, during the session, uh, one of the neighbor's boys, my age, uh, Arig's age, 17, comes running up. And this is uh, while Arig is building the funeral pyre. And he's in a huff and he says, uh, I need help. I need help. Tad, my little brother is, uh, my, my brother is sick. And I know these two kids because they're neighbors and uh, they would have known Arig. They would have worked with Arig. They would have played with Arig. They're, you know, so Arig, of course, is in no, is in no, his own no mood. Arig is the same person, the same kid, but he has seen some horrors. So Arig is like suddenly an adult, right, with this kid Zach. So Arig kind of slows him down, pats him on the back, and says, "What is it?" And he tells him, and he says, "Arig barks up to Trotter, uh, the healing drought that you purchased from Ingrid. I give it to Zach. Let him administer it to his brother." And so quickly, Arig, uh, you know, deals with this nuisance right and trotter begrudgingly gives him the healing draught this is just a sip just a sip and uh and we send zach home to his brother give this to your brother if he's sick so at the end we're standing at the top celebrating uh debating well we, we certainly let's dismiss the the workers because we don't need to keep excavating this if we've succeeded but let's skin, let's let them eat and celebrate and then we'll send them home for the day and then we will all uh you know relax get on the boat and wait to see if this grudge guardian manifests itself at night. And we'll know for sure that we've achieved our goal. Meanwhile, uh, Zach comes running up, you know, screaming that his brother uh, is dead as a, uh, some kind of grotesque bone type spider had erupted from his back uh, and uh, leaving his, his brother dead. And this creature uh, exposed and, and, uh, and uh, so it ends, curtain falls on this scene as Zach explains that this bone spider has erupted from his brother's body. And Arig and all of us ultimately look in that direction and, and yeah, our job's not done here, but we got more to do. And curtain falls, brilliant session. Um, I love it. Um, for all of the hobby, for all of the gaming we do, for all of the games that we love and appreciate, and all the experiences we share as as gamers and as GMs and as players, um, somehow, somehow this has stood the test of time. Uh, what we are doing is fifty years old, and um, how we're doing it might be tweaked, might be slightly different, but there is a reason this D twenty OSR game which is Moldve, uh, basic D&D, expert D&D remastered, uh, is still provides a phenomenal experience. And we can, you know, there are people who want to denigrate it. It's murder, hoboism, it's not murder. Uh, it, the, the, you know, uh, people attach, um, they attach their own, their own baggage to these things uh, and they want it to be different. They want it to be what they want it to be. And I've always said, pick pick a game that works for you. 
pick the people that work for you and go do that. You know, why are you wasting your breath telling other people they're playing wrong? Why are you telling, don't waste your breath telling people they're playing a bad game. Um, uh, For whatever reason, you don't like it, so be it. And for whatever reason, um, you don't appreciate it, so be it. For whatever reason, you don't enjoy it, so be it. You know, it's ice cream, you know, vanilla ice cream and chocolate ice cream, right? Um, but it's it's interesting because I'm. It's not the experiences I'm having. Uh, you know, I I, uh, I I play authentic characters regardless of the system. Lethality for me is a must because the world we live in is lethal, and lethality gives it gravitas. Lethality gives it a level of fear and danger that I think must exist for me to feel a character is in a compromised position. Um, and I've talked about that uh, uh, before. If it isn't lethal, it I'm not invested a lot in it. And that's not because I want to see characters die. It's because I want to recognize the realities of the situation we're in, which, by the way, is the world we live in. It is a lethal, lethal place. And if we didn't live in the environment we live in, we would be exposed to that lethality every day of our lives. But we have the luxury in the modern world that we are very much removed from the lethality of life on this planet on a daily basis, despite the fantasy of monsters, etc. Starvation, illness, uh, hypothermia, uh, tribal warfare. These things are facts they're, they're, and they exist. And we are, as humans, we are vulnerable, right? We aren't. We are actually a very vulnerable creatures. Okay, so I love it, and uh, uh, it this these characters and wouldn't manifest themselves in certain ways if not for these extreme situations. And fantasy allows crazy worlds, crazy situations, in which we can experience these amazing mysteries, adventures, and fun from these perspectives of humans in these extreme situations and i enjoy it and i enjoy it immensely and i have no problem with the black and white uh of the more moral code of it right uh the good versus the evil the uh i have no problem with the players deciding the moral compass the characters deciding the moral compass right let the world around us decide that our characters are somehow immoral uh, uh last night was a was an amazing session as as Todd, just out of the corner of your eye, you see your family's been dug up, and and uh, and of course, my response was, "Damn it!" You know. And meanwhile, uh, I you know Avery begins to call the the Grudge Guardian a desecrator. So I'm screaming desecrator as it's screaming desecrators. So there's this amazing mirrored moment where I'm dealing with what the Grudge Guardian is in a way dealing with on an eternal cursed level. And I thought this is, you don't get this shit anywhere else, right? We didn't write this shit. And it only dawned on me as I'm screaming desecrator back and I'm dropping down to face this thing. I'm, I, nobody's going to stop me. I literally had become my, I become my enemy. And this is the world we live in. Be careful your bullshit because you become the thing that you're railing against. And I experienced that, right? I actually became the grudge guardian against the grudge guardian. And I thought uh, it hit me, I don't know, at some point uh, uh, as I dropped into the tomb and I'm, I'm getting ready to melee with this thing and, and knowing as a player, knowing good and well, I'm probably going to die. Uh, uh, luckily standing in the sunlight, it couldn't harm me. But what, what was so amazing about that moment is I realized, oh, wow. Uh, in a way I had become the monster that it, and that it cursed us and that was uh that was that's amazing and that 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 happens live and it happens uh, almost subconsciously or um, right because it's not a conscious thing um it's great and um so say what you want about what we do in old DD say what you want about what we do with the osc with the old school osr retro clones uh, we are experiencing amazing characters and we are experiencing amazing events and we are uh, we are experiencing these uh, uh, system and all, uh, despite uh, you know the, uh, the the so-called observations about why it can't be better than it is, and I disagree with that.
It is. There's a reason it's been around 50 years. There's a reason people still play it. There's a reason there's hundreds of OSRs that are uh, that try to provide uh, uh, other uh, these same things with slightly t different tweaks, homebrews that are published as their own thing. It's remarkable. And there's there is a reason why we're still doing this. There's a reason why it's still fun. There's a reason why it works. Um, the game and the people you play with, uh, that's the big deal, right? So I've said, I think it starts first with who you play with. Um, I don't care what game you choose. If you play with the wrong people, if you play with people who are murder hobos, if you play with people who are, you know, bastards or, um, you know, goofy or whatever, you're, you're going to have a different experience. If you play with the right people and you pick, uh, you, you're playing with the right people and you're picking uh, the, the, the kind of genre and subject matter and games you want to enjoy, you're going to have great experiences. And I've said before, nothing like a great book. Uh, I'm a film guy. So for me, a great television show or a great movie for me, it can be the epitome of, uh, of experiencing story. Uh, literature is second for me. Uh, I didn't grow up a reader. I became a reader later, but film and television for me is the, is the, for me, the apex of experiencing stories, literature, of course, role-playing, changes that uh it elevates this to an experience as opposed to witnessing a thing to be to experiencing the thing so role playing for me is the absolute uh, peak of 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 hobby peak of thing to do that includes the same the same variables that exist in literature and in film but we get to experience it live it's not written and we get to put these people, these characters in these dangerous and strange situations or these bizarre situations, whether it's Call of Cthulhu trying to solve a crime, trying to expose the, the uh, supernatural, or whether we are uh, you know, going into the misty mountains or as a group to deal, you know, to deliver the, the, the whatever, uh, you know, uh, uh, on a grand journey to do the thing or whether we are helping the small village eradicate you know evil goblins from a local cave you know whatever whether in dark age of man uh i am playing the uh you know the uh uh the local uh uh what am i trying to say here local uh, soldier for the uh, lord's garrison who wants to elevate you know, has a uh, spec, you know, he wants to improve his lot in life and will endeavor to do other things as a mercenary to do that, right, on, be on behalf of the Lord, etc. cetera. And um, uh, it's, it is, it's fantastic. So again, thanks guys, great session. Uh, I think I did the recap pretty good. I'm a little tired and uh, um, uh, so I got a little brain fog, uh, antihistamines, it's allergy season for me, so creates a little brain fog. So I'm not hundred percent, but anyway, thank you everybody watching. Uh, I hope you, uh, I hope you guys had as much fun as I do. And I hope you guys appreciate these uh, recaps, uh, keep you up to speed as to what we're doing. All right. Bye.